So thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. I'm really, truly honored to be here. Um, and I'm here for one reason, which is purpose. Everyone in this room shares a passion, a drive, and a purpose that makes our work meaningful. And the NCRC has dedicated 30 years to promoting access to basic banking services, affordable housing, entrepreneurship, job creation in communities that sadly remain underserved all across America. And we're grateful for the opportunity to partner with the NCRC, with Jesse and John, who've been great partners to us as we've come to know them over the past year. We're here because we share the same mission. Square's mission is about financial inclusion. Nine years ago, Square's founders, Jack Dorsey and Jim McKelvey, set out to improve a financial system that was exclusive, unfair, and super complicated. Jim was a glass artist who missed out on a big sale because he didn't take credit cards. It was literally as simple as that. This is actually the piece of art that he was trying to sell. He didn't have the, the tools to accommodate his customer who wanted to pay. Now you might ask, why didn't Jim take credit cards? Today it seems totally easy, but really think back nine years ago to how many small businesses across America didn't take credit cards. And you have to ask yourself, why? Getting started with systems like credit cards was super complex and discriminates against many individuals and small businesses that don't have credit card history and credit history. I don't know what, how many people in this room have ever tried to open up a credit card account. It's incredibly complicated and takes a long time. And so the notion of financial access is where Square started. And I realize that might not have seemed obvious to so many of you who have used the simple square dongle in a taxi or in a retail store or a bodega. This is Jim. He's there with an early to prototype of our first credit card reader. And before square, fewer than 40% of business owners who applied for credit cards could get access. They weren't approved. And so think about something as simple as credit card access. It's crazy. And with Square's technology, we completely changed the risk paradigm by applying technology to a very old problem. And so what we did was apply this credit card reader to a simple mobile device. And we took a philosophy that we weren't gonna stop people from gaining access before they even tried. We were only going to stop them if their behavior proved to be problematic or risky. Just think about that mentality. Innocent until proven guilty is another way to think about it. <laughs> even today, that's not the way most of the credit card system works. And you would think even with Square being ubiquitous across so many millions of businesses in the United States that we would have changed it but we frankly didn't. Jim's story lays the groundwork, not only for Square, but more broadly for how we've continued to use technology to address the challenges of small businesses across multiple avenues of issues they face gaining access to the financial system. And we think technology should be a game changer for everybody. Economic empowerment, is the primary driver of our purpose at Square. It's written on our wall. We don't just make hardware. We don't just write algorithms. Using technology, we develop tools for all communities, including those who are underserved, that everyone in this room serves every day. We can level the playing field. At Square, we know that we have an opportunity to make a contribution to society in helping millions of businesses thrive. And we also understand that we have a responsibility to place our customers at the center of everything we do. Square only grows when our sellers are successful. And we want every seller, regardless of community, class, or wealth, 
to have the tools to succeed. So when you walk into Square's offices across the United States, this is what you will see. And it is first and foremost right in front of you when you walk in the door and it's in the main board conference room of how we operate. Super important to the purpose and the work that 2,400 employees of Square do. When Square went public on the New York Stock Exchange at the end of 2015, two people rang the opening bell. And there are a few things I want you to note in this picture. First, it's not inside with a bunch of fancy executives standing up top on a bell, being super happy and congratulating themselves. What we decided to do for Square, again, speaking to who we are, the people we are trying to serve, is that we opened up the front of the New York Stock Exchange to a market, to a small business market. And we brought in Square sellers to the front of the market. So you have Mr. Todd's Pies right behind there. You have Lily Bell. You have Jack's mom, Marsha. Marsha owns a coffee shop in St. Louis. And Sherry, who owns this flower shop, Lily Bell, in San Francisco, was actually the first Square seller. And I'll tell you her story. <laughs> Sherry's great. So Sherry owned a flower cart in San Francisco in Mint Plaza. Only took cash, has no credit history, tiny little business. That's what she lives on, is the success of these flowers. So Sherry, uh, every day Jack and Jim would walk by after they built the prototype, and they would try to convince her to try it. She basically said, no interest, I'm good. I'm good, and they would watch people come and go. They'd buy and sell flowers. And then one day, a guy walked up, went to buy flowers, and he only had cash. She said, okay, well, there's an ATM a block away, as she always did, year after year. And unfortunately, the guy walked away. And with Jack and Jim standing there, they essentially said to her, I think you just lost the sale. She was like, no, 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 they're coming back. And she lost the sale. And she finally agreed to try the little credit card reader. And at the time, it was a pretty novel approach. Nobody plugged little things into their cell phone to move money back and forth within a second. That was just not something that you would trust as a small business owner on the streets of San Francisco, as Sherry was. And sure enough, Sherry realized that if she took something as simple as credit cards for her little business, her business would grow and thrive, and it changed her world. So here we are at the New York Stock Exchange, fast forward nine years later, and Sherry and Jack's mom, Marsha, rang the bell by tapping on a transaction and selling some flowers in front of the New York Stock Exchange. So Sherry, <laughs> so Sherry proudly took Square public which we were happy to celebrate with. So who else do we serve? And why do we think the mission is so important? Most of our businesses have sales of less than $250,000 a year. It's Main Street. The coffee shop, the pizza shop, the hair salon, the dentist, the plumber. While we started by enabling credit card acceptance to ensure sellers never miss the sale, we broaden to tools much beyond that. We incorporate our seller's feedback with a point of view on technology and commerce, how we can help businesses grow. And we empower small businesses with the same tools that an Amazon might have and level the playing field in a way that you might not have thought of for small businesses. When someone can see that they sell a lot of coffee between 3 and 4 p.m. and they never had the analytical tools to provide that support and insight to their business, they realize that maybe they should shift their hours. And so tools like Square have enabled businesses to thrive in a very independent way all across America. One of the biggest pain points still suffered by many small businesses, though, is access to capital. We hear this over and over and over. And even after somebody puts in all the hard work to get their business up and running, they can't access capital to grow. 
They can't perform inventory growth opportunities. They can't do repairs. Something happens, they're living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck like so many small businesses are. They can't invest in their staff. And speed and access to lending hasn't been on a small business owner's side, as so many of you in this room know. Even after spending hours, days, filling out a loan application, large numbers of businesses either don't receive any funding or extended only a fraction of what they need. And it's even more difficult for underserved communities. So many traditional lenders assess creditworthiness in a way that results in a denial of loan applications due to factors like insufficient collateral, low credit scores, insufficient credit history. And that's frankly why we started Square Capital, which I run. Our small business lending program is built on the foundation of years of payment and transaction data that we've amassed since our founding. Data from millions of Square sellers inform our machine learning models so we can determine the credit worthiness of a small business based on its sales and transactions, not what color ink the loan application is written on. It gets better. <laughs> I've, we see real-time business cash flow trajectory for abilities, a business's ability to pay over time so that business owners don't have to provide a pile of documents or their individual credit scores to a bank loan officer who they do not know and really just don't trust. Square Capital looks at the health of a business. And as a result of this model, we find that we can serve many businesses that almost no one else does. So since 2008, the financial crisis, the lending environment has become less constrained only for borrowers at the highest levels, as many of you know. And we have focused on loans under $100,000, which very, very few banks focus on. And it is a level of tremendous need for the unmet and underserved communities. And we are enabling access in a way that prioritizes transparency, speed, and simplicity. And for us, increasing access to capital is more about determining eligibility and also is about providing a small business owner the right size loan to help their business. Our average loan size is $6,000. And this is an amount that most financial services companies don't offer. And so in just over three years, we facilitated about $2.8 billion in funding to over 140,000 businesses. And like NCRC, our interests are mutually aligned with those we serve. We only succeed when our customers succeed. Don't just take it from me, though. I'm going to show you a few of our stories. The impact of what capital can do for businesses that we serve. This is Lucia Rowland. She turned her basement business into a 3,000 square foot dark room for the community, for photographers. She has the Bushwick Community Dark Room in Brooklyn, New York, and she started it out of the financial crisis. This is Philip Weber, who started Jive Turkey Legs in Gastonia, North Carolina. <laughs> he was able to grow his catering business and support his food truck. Now imagine him walking into an intimidating Chase branch or another branch. Then there's Andy Cullen, same story. Imagine walking into a bank branch. He owns Cullen Electric in Lachland, Ohio. And with Square Capital, he tripled his workforce and fleet size to over 10,000 customers locally. So now I'd like to take a look at Courtney Foster and the owner of a single chair hair salon who's used Square Capital to launch her own hair care line. Having my own business has set my soul on fire. It's made me realize that I can achieve anything that I want to do. It doesn't matter where you came from. 
I am Courtney Foster. I own Courtney Foster Beauty, which is a one chair salon studio. I had my son Xavier when I was 19 years old. I was definitely scared. I was scared out of my mind. I needed to work. I needed to take care of my son. I did try to get a loan the traditional way by going to the bank, but they required so much of what I didn't have being a new business. It just made it really difficult to get that financial help. That's when I was introduced to Square. I'm now on my second loan through Square Capital, and that has allowed me to expand my brand. I've seen you do whatever you want to do, despite whatever's in your way. You just push through it. If I look back at my 19-year-old self, I would tell that girl, just keep going. Just keep going because it'll <laughs> eventually work out. And it did. We have a, um, a website. It's square, um, square up forward slash capital forward slash access. And there is a longer version of this video that is so incredible and goes through a whole series of stories like Courtney's that are absolutely incredible. And you listen to these entrepreneurs. Could you imagine walking into a bank and telling them that you run a hair salon out of your apartment and try to finance your beauty care line? That just would not work. But what's interesting is when you see the data and success of hair business, and you actually look beyond the person, straight to the numbers and the success that she is achieving. It's rather extraordinary. And we can retell this story millions of times over across the United States. And I think it's an incredible, powerful story of how technology can enable an industry that has otherwise operated in the way it, it had in a, in a very different way than had ever, it had ever been served before. And so I know these stories are incredibly powerful, and this was just one very small example, but I think it's a great example of how someone can grow and realize their full potential. And so I'd like to close by just saying um, it's great to be here, and it's great to see where we can go from here, and we're focused on supporting the mission of the NCRC. And we all know our work is far from over, but that's where we see the opportunity between the NCRC and Square. In our combined interests in continuing to serve those that the financial system has left behind, we couldn't be more excited. The door was open for Courtney Foster, and it can be open for millions of small businesses that hear no all the time. If you were enthusiastic before at my comments, about who we serve, I thought you'd want to hear some of the statistics in a little bit more detail. A year ago, we ran a survey. We actually just ran it. The results literally came in like 10 minutes before I started. They're almost the same. Um, and what we saw was that over 54% of our sellers that we provide loans to are women. So compare that to 18% across the rest of the United States. And when we look at underrepresented minorities, over 37% of our loans are to underrepresented minorities, which is extraordinary and far past others in the United States. In addition to that, 80% of our funding goes to businesses outside the 25 most populous cities in the United States. And I think this is going to be an increasing problem over time when we look at how banking services are provided in rural America and smaller communities across America. I think technology is a fascinating and interesting way to enable credit to be provided in small communities across the United States. And interestingly, when we survey our sellers, 84% of our business owners say that Square Capital not just helped their business stay afloat, but helped them grow. Super important. So I believe in the benefits of a strong partnership and working together. 
And I think it can really make the difference to access capital and give small businesses the tools they need to grow. There's an existing ecosystem working to support communities and businesses, and I think we all need to work closer together to continue this mission. We all have that responsibility, and we all share that common purpose. So Square looks forward to joining with the NCRC as we establish the new Innovation Council. We'll work closely with many of the organizations represented at this conference. As new partners with new ideas, we can find ways to leverage technology and achieve change at a national level. We can collaborate to invest time, resources, and small business growth and provide advocates like you with the tools needed to eradicate systematic unfairness. And we can deliver equal opportunity and access and fair financial services for this generation and lay a foundation of new tools and technology going forward. When, we, when small businesses succeed, we succeed. And while we might approach the problem in a very different way than you, we still are looking at economic inequality as the most important purpose of the reason why Square exists and the sellers we are seeking to serve. And so we're unified in our focus of helping Main Street thrive. Thank you very much. <laughs> Q&A time. You can ask me anything. How about another round of applause yeah. for Jackie? Do I have to sit here? Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be a little, the stool, the awkward stool crouch here. Yeah. I think Jackie really knew this crowd. I noticed a number of the businesses were food-based businesses, and every time one went up, people were like, ooh. <laughs> we have a lot of food trucks on the Square system. So Jackie, you talked a lot about um, the mission of economic empowerment and, and having been to the Square offices, it's right up there on the wall. People really talk and live and breathe it seemingly. How do you make that real? I mean, this crowd is very familiar with corporate social responsibility, slogans, sort of how do you make it uh, yeah. real? How do you make it a living thing within the company? So I. It's actually not a slogan for us. Um, it's very interesting. I think people's behavior, words, and actions are completely aligned and congruent. And um, it ranges from the way we think about our sellers to our workflow and everything we do. So I'll start with our product development process. Our product development process is all driven through the eyes of a seller. And we literally start with narratives. And our narratives for building our products would say things like, Courtney Foster is complaining that she has no short-term cash cushion for her business. We've then gone out and met with 10 more square sellers across five different cities. And they are all saying that they can't get short-term access to capital. That feels like a need. It feels like a job that we need to do. And so everything we do, is framed in a narrative around our sellers. So we start our product development process that way. Our engineering process is driven that way. Our annual planning process is driven that way. And then the stories we tell every other Friday when we do all company meetings are also done that way. And so it's not a situation where you have a group of executives who stand up and do a rallying cry it literally is weaved throughout the fabric of an entire company so that culturally you have to think about your sellers first. So you'll see. <laughs> Thank you. You can ask any question you want, sir. Um, so, um, but I don't think people do it. I think, you know, they put slogans on a wall and then ignore it. And we are the exact opposite, which is the work drives what we do, and that went up afterwards. Um, and, I, and I do think, you know, like you could look at my Twitter feed, at Jackie Recess, when I go to a city, I'll go stop in and see Square Sellers. And I'll say, I'll ask them, I'll say, hi, I'm Jackie, I run Square Capital. Curious, you know, I, I actually know before I go there that they have a capital loan out. Curious how things are going. And usually I'll hear back like, 
I don't like that I can't turn off the cache option on the, you know, it's some very specific feature that they don't like. And I will literally come back and I'll write it up and I'll send a note to everyone on our team that says, here's the feedback from, you know, the Hilton gift shop. You know, the cashier said that she can't get the following three things to work. And I think there's a reason why the products are so intuitive to small businesses because we really listen to how they operate. And then I think for the capital piece, honestly, this is everyone's biggest pain point and I think it's an absolute sin that small business credit is not more available in small communities. And I fundamentally believe the way we do it is the way of the future and that you look at a business's data, it doesn't matter who the person is or where they're from or what their education is or whether they had a bankruptcy beforehand. Everyone gets the chance to start a business and if the business is thriving, give them credit. And so that's the approach we took to it. Um, and we have very low default rates because the business speaks for itself. So Jackie, trust is really in, in a sense the currency of banking um, and there are some irresponsible actors out there in the fintech space. Trust in banking institutions following the financial crisis is sort of at a low. Have you found that this mission of economic empowerment, this focus, has really made good business sense? Are you, are you doing well while, while doing right? Does it differentiate you from the competition? Well, <clears throat> we're not a nonprofit. And um, we're in the business of um, making money. I think that's fair for a company to be, but that doesn't mean you can't serve multiple purposes. It doesn't mean you can't um, have economic empowerment and serving the underserved is the core focus of your, of your mission. And I think they can operate and exist um, together. I think trust is a really important word. And I think it's one of the biggest problem with large financial institutions and many financial institutions. You know, I went to Wharton undergrad and I worked at Goldman Sachs for a long time. I can't read my own mortgage application. And I'm not alone. I, I don't understand what half of the documentation is. I don't understand what it means. And I find that the complexity of financial information is, is bedeviling. And people are embarrassed and afraid, because the, and then they have no one to ask. And what I like about our products is that they're super simple and intuitive and clear. You borrow $1,000, you pay back 1100 nothing else, no more fee. And I think we've built nine years worth of trust um, into our products where when you see someone, when you at, go find someone who uses Square at their shop, they usually smile and love it. They usually say, oh my god, I love Square. And um, I think it's because we've systemically built trust and simplicity into our products. In a, it's almost like a consumer product in a, in a business setting um, and trying to make it intuitive for people. And I think that's super important. Same with our loans are the exact same way. There is like no fine print. It's all right there and super simple that humans can read it and understand it. Um, unlike everything else that I sign, um, you know, in my, my personal life. So I think we're, we're just empathetic to the issue. But honestly, I do read every screen and we get all kinds of feedback and I'll be like, who understands that? We can't send that out. And usually someone will say, oh, it's legal, it's a regulatory thing. I'm, really, there's no better way to say that so that normal people understand that? Um, and that, that is the fight of our day to day. Um, in trying to explain things in a really intuitive way. So, so let's talk a little bit about how it actually works, because the, the square is really just one piece of it. Um, there's a whole data and analytics piece in terms of how you analyze and help businesses, and ultimately how you underwrite the loans that you make through Square Capital. Talk us through how that all works. Yeah, and look, I, you know, I, I'd say this, which is I'm, I'm using Square as an example because I think uh, it's a great example of how technology can be used in probably a way that none of you have thought of. And I just think it's emblematic of many companies where you'd say like, huh, I'd never really thought of the cash register that sits at the end of that bodega as a vehicle for bringing someone into the financial system. So what I do think when you think about it at that macro level, it's kind of a provocative thought. 
about how something that you're used to in your day-to-day -day life can actually have such an impactful change in a small business owner's experience. And I do think that's interesting. I don't really mean to be a commercial for Square. Um, um, the way the product works, I think, is really interesting, um, too. And I, and I think it's a good lesson um, in how data can impact an underserved community. So I'll use Courtney's hair salon as a great example. Courtney has eight customers a day, let's just say, $100 a pop, so $800 a day. So in Square, in our point of sale system, we see every transaction. We see all the credit cards that get swiped through. We see that Courtney has a really consistent business. Every day, five days a week, she does eight hair appointments. So now we know what Courtney's projected revenue is for the year. So then I could say, okay, what's it? this is all done through machine learning models. What is Courtney's expected annual sales? And what do I think is a reasonable loan size that she should have? And it's probably about uh, eight to 10 months of her revenue. And you, then you take a, a small portion of it that we think she could pay back every day. And so we, we do simple math like that. And then we say, what's the percent that she should be able to pay back? And then out of her daily card swipes, out of the $100 at a time, she pays us back. So that it, if she's slow, if one day she only does four hair appointments, she only pays back that for four. If one day she does 10, she pays back that for 10. And so it's super, if she goes on vacation for two weeks, she doesn't owe us anything. Um, super simple. Um, but it's a, it's a fascinating way to let the vagaries of people's business benefit their success. So when we had all the hurricanes um, and the fires in Northern California, one of the things Square did in advance was call everybody and tell them that they wouldn't have to worry about their loan payments until they were back up processing on Square. We knew it was going to be a tough time. So why try to tell people they owe you money when you know they can't operate their business. And so we sent out preemptive emails in advance of all the hurricanes to basically say, don't worry about it. This is the way our loans work. When you're back up and running, that's when you pay us back. And then we literally just moved as their business moved. And so we think that dynamic creates a really nice opportunity for small businesses who have a lot of volatility in their day-to-day growth, and so our sellers love it. We have a less than 4% default rate. Um, millions of small businesses are on Square, um, and so it's been a really successful product um, that our sellers love. So you mentioned default rate. Uh, you know, making small, relatively small business loans is somewhat risky, and so, you know, people in, in our audience think about pricing and they think about defaults. Talk about that in the context of Square and in the context of the industry. Yep, so um, our fees are 10 to 17%. And you could either look at that and say it's super high or super low, depending on, you know, it's lower than a credit card or more expensive than a, a traditional loan. And the way we price our loans is based on risk. And so we know at the riskiest end of the spectrum, we get a lot more defaults and we try to price based on that level of risk. As I said, we're not a nonprofit. We need to make money too. And so we come up with pricing that we think is fair, that also enables us to make profit, that our sellers think is fair. And so we've kind of tried to find that right balance for what makes sense, and that's how we came up with 10 to 17% fees for the loans. We think we're actually competing with friends, and we're competing with folks' credit cards. But the simplicity and the ease when you don't have a credit history and the way that we operate makes a product like that super attractive. And if someone wants to debate the rate, we will often say to them, go like see what your options are. If you don't, you know, it's fine. We actually think it's a very attractive opportunity given the way that it works and the way that we operate um, with all of our sellers. And interestingly, the other dynamic that we have is that we want their business to grow. And so that's why we think we're pricing right in the middle. 
which is the more they grow, the more they process on Square. We're totally aligned with them. As I said, we're not a nonprofit. Um, but having said that, when they succeed, we succeed. And so we've actually proven that those who take Square Capital loans were actually able to grow their business. Um, and so we think we're striking that right balance of, of fairness. From a fair lending perspective, uh, you know, there's a lot of concerns about the use of machine learning, the use of alternative credit scoring models because of their potential uh, you know, to bake into the equation things that may be grounded in discrimination. How do you guard against that? I think everybody knows sort of, you know, the, the Microsoft AI example, the bot that became racist within 24 hours of reacting to people. How, how do you guard against sort of machine learning, alternative underwriting mechanisms, veering into a territory that could facilitate uh, discrimination as opposed to tackling it? Yeah, I think we have an un unusual data set in that we see a business's revenue and, and costs and we see their whole business. So I think we have a view that very few people have and that's really unusual. And so um, I think we've been able to provide financing to underserved communities and frankly I think we've proven that a lot of people don't and can't. Um, because somehow we are able to offer loans to these communities and groups of women and underrepresented minorities, rural communities, we have a less than 4% default rate. And these are folks that we have a relationship with across Square. And I think when you only are looking purely at financial data, I think that's what's interesting as to who we are offering loans to and what we see as success because our view of success and thriving businesses all across America looks like 54% women and 37% underrepresented minorities whose businesses we are helping thrive. And that view of success is purely financially driven based on the success of their businesses. How are you gonna avoid, and I'm talking here more broadly of sort of the FinTech industry. So many of us are familiar with what happened during the subprime boom and the rapid expansion of independent mortgage companies, many of whom in fact were essentially technology companies doing lending. Uh, and we all know how sort of that story ends, right? It started out maybe in a more responsible place and then it shifted and then it shifted and then it shifted and suddenly you have millions of loans uh, going into default because the industry model was really, you know, originate a loan and then sell it. Um, and, and bear very little of the risk. There are a lot of similarities uh, with the fintech industry today. Um, how, you know, how are fintechs going to avoid sort of the perils um, that independent mortgage companies and others found themselves in in the subprime crisis? I think there'll be good, good actors and bad actors everywhere you go. And you look at the systemic risks in the banking system from 2007 and 2008 and they were actually driven by contractual interrelationships of financial institutions in a way that nobody quite understood. And it was largely driven out of the largest banks in the world and their own interdependencies on how they were looking at risky, risky credits and their judgments they were making about what risk was. And so I, you know, I think FinTech, you could add every FinTech player up and not even be a decimal point in Citigroup's balance sheet. Um, and in reality, I think across the entire board, you'd have to look systemically at the entire banking industry. I don't think FinTech will be any more or less of a player in that uh, dynamic in a way that's different than the banking system evolved in 2008 where you had good actors and bad actors in every level of the stack, community banks, you know, traditional banks, very large banks, regional banks. I think every bank has their own culture and style of the way they operate, and every bank has their own risk profile. And that's what I think you'll end up seeing. Thankfully, Dodd-Frank did a lot to tamp down systemic risk uh, with a lot of the too big to fail rules. I think there's a lot of debates going on right now as to whether they tamp down lending too much, uh, particularly on the small side. I think one of the things we've seen post-2008, and I referenced it, 
is how little credit actually flowed back into the market for those who want less than a million dollars. And I think that's where folks like us are trying to pick up the slack because banks disappeared from that market and they haven't come back 10 years later. And I think that's a true problem for the community and that you need to find a way to build a profitable way to lend. And I think that's what's interesting for all of you in this room. I think the model that we've developed is a really interesting twist on understanding data and credit profiles in a more profound way than any large bank could ever truly understand for small businesses because we see those transactions on a granular day-to-day -day model. And I think that model is paradigm shifting for small businesses and local communities because it really levels the playing field of how they could click three buttons and get access to capital or have financial tools that are the same analytical capabilities as if they were Amazon. And I think that's where tech has really changed in the past 10 years and provided tools that just didn't exist in the 03 to 06 timeframe pre-credit crisis. Many people in this room, I, I can sense the bankers starting to, to <laughs> get a little uncomfortable, grumble a little maybe. Um, many people in this room know that NCRC traditionally has been very pro-bank in the sense that we want banks in our neighborhoods, serving our neighborhoods. <laughs> uh, but over the course of the last several years, we've seen thousands of bank branches close and a real retrenchment from many communities, particularly rural communities. Uh, there was a Federal Reserve study that showed that uh, where a lot of places uh, where fintechs are gaining a lot of market traction is in fact uh, those communities where banks have, have left, have closed branches. Uh, and one of the reasons we wanted to have this session is really a moment to us and a challenge to us to say how are those communities going to get served? And we're big believers in physical presence and in branches. But how are those communities going to get served uh, if, uh, if banks have withdrawn? Sort of a challenge not just to the fintech industry uh, to be responsible, but also a challenge to our partners and our friends and banks to think about those communities that right now are getting left behind in terms of being served by traditional yeah. banks. I mean, you we're, we're f we have no issue with banks either. And, and frankly, we can't compete with big bank loans. We don't have the cost of capital that you know the biggest banks in the world do. Um, and so we are best at serving small. Um, and I do think, though, the, the style of technology that we offer is paradigm changing for small communities that are getting left behind. We published a movie. It's actually a beautiful movie. Um, we've now done four of them. They're called the Dream Series. I urge everybody to watch them. If you thought Courtney Foster was inspirational, boy, have we got stories for you. The first one was an immigrant, a Syrian immigrant who moved to Tennessee and opened up a falafel shop outside of his church and Yassin's falafel, and it tells the story of Yassin as a um, Syrian immigrant um, coming to the United States. And not, there's no square in the entire thing, but they're just very moving stories of entrepreneurs. One of them was about Lakota Indian Reservation and how they use square on the Indian Reservation. One of them was about Webster City in Iowa and how square basically powers the town. And it's this incredibly inspirational story of how the movie theater was reconstructed because once Main Street died in this town that used to be an Electrolux factory that closed, they knew that the town was going to die. And so they weren't, wouldn't let that happen and they did a redo of a movie theater there. And almost every business in the town uses Square by fluke. And it's really about how Square gave these little businesses the opportunity to have a level playing field. And the last one um, was just released. It's uh, about a woman who was incarcerated for 13 years. And she started a thrift shop with ex-honorees who um, all work in the thrift shop and are supporting the thrift shop uh, in a community. And she only hires uh, folks who come out of jail. And she, by the way, was only guilty of not um, turning in her boyfriend. 
And so she was in jail for third, it's called Sister Hearts. And they are the most incredible stories. And it's watching these entrepreneurs talk about how they build their community. Um, and, you know, we love being a part of it. Thank you, Jackie. We need to leave it there, but how about another round of applause for our speaker? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.